السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم in the name of Allah سبحانه وتعالى most gracious most merciful الحمد لله all praise is indeed due to Allah سبحانه وتعالى والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين complete blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم his household, his companions, may Allah bless them all for indeed they have struggled, they strove, they worked very hard, they tried, they dedicated, they gave their lives in order that the deen be preserved and passed on in a way that today we are seated here. May Allah bless them all and may Allah bless you all and may Allah keep us from among those who learn, who put into practice and who convey the message. This evening's talk is going to be very simple, but very, very important. We are Muslimin. We believe in Allah. We believe in Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam being the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My brothers and sisters, we need to know something. Knowledge and to learn is absolutely important because without knowing we would not be able to worship Allah. That's why Allah says, "Inna yakhsha Allah min ibadihi ulama." Indeed, from among the worshippers of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, those who are truly fearful of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala are the knowledgeable because they know Allah. They know who is Allah, the power of Allah, the anger of Allah, the wrath of Allah, the mercy of Allah, the system of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They understand how small we are, how insignificant we are, and how great Allah is. So they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It goes to show that if you want to worship Allah properly, correctly, you need to know Allah. The more you know your Rabb, the more you know your Maker, the more you will feel to worship Him. The more your acts of worship will be fruitful, the more you will be conscious of Him if you realize that you have to die. And when you die, you return to the same Maker who made you in the first place. Then you will realize that the 70 years that you are going to live on earth is actually a very short period of time. It is so short that there is no point transgressing against Allah. When a person commits a sin, whether it is adultery, whether it is uh, drinking alcohol, whether it is whatever other sins they are, the pleasure of it, number one, is false. Number two, it is short-lived. Number three, it comes with regret. Number four, it results in the displeasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it cannot come about with goodness. When you know Allah, you realize all these four things one time. That you know what? I'm wasting my time. It's going to be too short. This pleasure is false. At the same time, it will bring about regret and I will be displeasing Allah. So I'm not going to displease Him. I'll stay away from it. If you do that and you stay away from sin because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gives you a special position. What is that special position? He speaks about it in so many different narrations of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know that Allah has spoken to us in two ways. One is through the Quran, revelation to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the words of, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Quran. Two is Revelation to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the words being that of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, explaining what Allah said, that is known as hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They are both from Allah. وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ He does not utter words from his whims and fancies, but everything is indeed revealed from Allah. Revelation that has come from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we realize this, it is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we will come to respect the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as well. Today, across the globe, there are people challenging Islam. There are some who have been brainwashed into believing that the Quran alone is from Allah. As for the hadith, it's not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They don't know. 
that the Quran itself, if you were to follow it, it will lead you to the Sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Haven't you heard Allah saying, "Wama atakum al-Rasul fakhudhu, wama nahaakum anhu fantahu, wattaqu Allah." Whatever the Messenger has given you, take it, adopt it. Whatever he has prohibited, consider it prohibited, and be conscious of Allah. In another place, Allah says, "Fala wa Rabbika la yu'minun hatta yuhakimu kafi ma shajar bainhum, thumma la yajidu fi anfusihim haraja, haraja min ma qadita wa yusallimu taslima." Nay, they cannot call themselves true believers until they consider you the judge in their disputes and they are very happy with your decision, your judgment such that they don't find in their hearts a single speck of negativity regarding what you decided, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When there is a dispute, we resolve it according to Allah and His Rasul. And we should not feel in our hearts that we were short-changed by the decision of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So going back to the point I was raising, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, سَبْعَةٌ يُضِلُّهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي ظِلِّهِ يَوْمَ لَا ظِلَّ إِلَّا ظِلُّهُ There will be seven categories of people who will be granted a shade on the day of judgment, the day that there will be no shade besides that of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So from among them will be someone who was called to commit a sin of adultery with all the facilitation, everything is ready, everything is easy to do, but only the consciousness of Allah stopped him or her from doing it. They will have a special place on the day of judgment. Why? They kept themselves away from sin because of Allah. Because of Allah. Another category, Shabun Nasha'a fi ibadatillahi ta'ala. A youngster. And mashallah, we have a lot of the young who are here. It is so delightful, so beautiful to see the young, the very young as well, seated in our midst. Mashallah, tabarakallah. May Allah bless you all and your parents and your progenies to come and grant you success in the dunya and the akhirah. You need to know from this age, when you grow up in the obedience of Allah, as you become adolescent, teenage and so on, you get your driver's license perhaps, you might thereafter have a little bit of freedom, you go into a university here and there. If you bear in mind who you are, and you bear in mind you need to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you grow up in the obedience of Allah, the day you die, you will be a VIP. Because that's what the hadith says, VIP. Why? Because I didn't commit sin from when I was young. I didn't go to the clubs. I didn't drink alcohol. I didn't commit adultery. I didn't do all the dirty things that they were to, to commit and so on. So Allah says, yes, I will give you. I will grant you. Don't worry. Subhanallah. It's amazing. Going back to the importance of knowledge, my brothers and sisters, every one of us make an effort to attend the lessons and the lectures that the ulama of your community hold in your masajid and within your localities. Make sure you benefit because Allah is going to ask you that I had for you in your society community, someone who came from wherever they came, they either lived with you or they came for a short period of time right in your midst. I sent them to you. What was your retaliation? What was your reaction? I sent them right to your midst. Did you listen to something good? Or did you just sleep back, relax? Perhaps on your phone, whatsapping everyone, while everyone else was listening to the goodness, you lost out. If there is a lesson or there is some form of recitation, recital to improve your Quran, your knowledge, your, the, the hadith of the Prophet wasallam, whether it comes to jurisprudence, the fiqh or the seerah of Rasulullah wasallam, whatever else, any point of benefit and learning, make sure you are there. Make sure you are the one who's there because your name will be written. And when that name is written, trust me, the angels make dua for everyone who comes together in order to remember Allah, listen to the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And above that, Allah makes mention of every one of us by name. 
knowledge is extremely important. We must make sure we make an effort to learn. So as Muslims, we all know how many pillars of Islam are there? How many pillars? Five pillars. Five pillars of Islam. We know that. When we talk of Islam, we are talking of that which you can see with your eyes. When we talk of Iman, we are talking of that which you cannot see with your eyes. Amantu billah wa malaikatihi wa kutubihi wa rusulihi wa liyawmil akhir wa al-qadr, etc, etc. You cannot see that with your eyes. I can claim a belief. I believe in the angels. I believe in the books. I believe in the prophets. I believe in good and bad. Fate comes from Allah. I believe in the last day and so on. You know and Allah knows whether you are truthful or not. But Islam, everyone can see you're a Muslim. Everyone can see you're a Muslim. Why? Because the five pillars are apparent. The first one, you've already said, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadur Rasulullah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Right? You have said it. I bear witness that there is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his final messenger. Okay? We have said it. We say it so many times in different words. Sometimes we say, Ashhadu Allah ilaha illallah. Wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasuluh. Right? What does it mean? We know what it means. There is none worthy of worship besides Allah. And Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his messenger. But put it into practice. Don't worship anyone besides Allah. When you go for salah, your mind must be with Allah. It mustn't be with a stick or a stone or a grave or a saint or an animal or a tree or a cave in Barbados. No. The worship is for Allah alone. No matter how great the mountain might be, you don't worship the mountain. You worship the Lord of the mountain. No matter how great the sea might be, the ocean might be, you don't worship the ocean. You worship the Lord of the ocean. No matter how bright the sun might shine, you don't worship the sun. You worship the Lord of the sun. No matter how amazing the stars may seem, you don't worship the stars. You worship the Lord of the stars. Him and Him alone shall we put our heads on the ground for. Nobody else. That's la ilaha illallah. Remember this. Then we come, this is a very short explanation. I could go longer, but I want to get to all the five pillars inshallah of Islam. Then we have the part where we declare that Muhammad sallallahu is indeed the messenger of Allah. Not only the messenger, but the final messenger of Allah. What is the job of a messenger? If someone says, I'm the messenger of that man, what does that mean? He came with a message. A message is carried by a messenger. So a messenger is a person who's carrying a message on behalf of someone else. So you have to respect the messenger because he came with the message. Subhanallah. Rasulun actually means one who is carrying risala. Risala means a message. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came with the message from Allah. But... Allah chose him for many reasons and Allah made him the best of creation, the most noble of all prophets, the final messenger of Allah, the one who had, who was protected by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from sin. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. So when we say his name, we are so grateful for the fact that he brought the message to us that we say, Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah's blessings and salutations be upon him. If you don't say that, peace be upon him. After the name, you're actually cursed. Subhanallah. This shows us appreciation. To appreciate what people have done for you. If someone did something good to you, appreciate it. Show appreciation. How do you show it? By thanking them. When you, when you hear their name, make a small dua for them. Subhanallah. Someone who's taught you Alif and Ba, how can you suddenly disrespect them? No, you have to respect them or you won't be able to derive the true benefit from that learning that you learned from them. Subhanallah, respecting your elders, respecting those who are older than you. The Prophet ﷺ says, whoever does not respect those who are older and does not have mercy on those who are younger is not from amongst us. He cannot call himself a follower of me. Subhanallah. So learn to respect those who are older. And those who are older, let us learn to have mercy on those who are young. When we are correcting them, when we are teaching them, we need to be merciful. 
We need to realize they will grow. They may, they may have a little bit of mischief here and there. We will correct them in the most beautiful manner. May Allah make it easy. So Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the final messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he came with the message and he taught us how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need to be thankful. We need to be thankful for this. And this is why there were people chosen by Allah to be the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were known as Sahaba. And we've got to say radiyallahu anhum after their names. All of them were powerful, beautiful, lovely, amazing individuals chosen by Allah. If they may have had a few small quarrels among them, very few and perhaps insignificant, we are nobodies to talk about them negatively. Nobodies. No matter who they are, we say radiyallahu anhum. And we believe that the best from amongst them was who? Say his name. Say his name. Abdullah ibn Uthman radiyallahu anhu. Abdullah ibn Uthman. Uthman was known as Abu Quhafa. So Abdullah was also known as Ibn Abi Quhafa radiyallahu anhu. And he used to be called Abu Bakr as well. But his name was Abdullah. Abdullah ibn Uthman. Today I think I taught you something, right? You were a little bit surprised. Where did he come from? Abdullah. We thought Abu Bakr was the best. Yes, he is Abu Bakr, but his name is Abdullah. His father was Uthman. So Abdullah ibn Uthman is the name of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu. And Uthman used to be known as Abu Quhafa. So he was known as Ibn Abi Quhafa. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. I love saying this because we need to know the man. He is the best to tread the earth after the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala without a doubt, without a doubt. Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. He was the man whom when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa needed anything or asked for something, he did it to the extent. He didn't waste time, not at all. He didn't ask questions. You know, when they needed wealth for one of the battles, he came with everything he had. Subhanallah, that was Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu. When everyone from Quraysh thought that they could go to him and they could claim that, you know what? Uh, your friend Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam claims that he went up to the heavens and came back down and he went to Jerusalem the same night. They thought he would say no. You know what he said? If he said it, he's telling the truth. Allahu Akbar. If he said it, he is telling the truth. As Siddiq. May Allah make us even a small portion like that. May Allah unite us with these powerful men in the Akhirah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us Jannah al firdaus So my brothers and sisters, they, the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, struggled to do what? To learn, to preserve. They put their lives at risk. Today, small things happen. People stop you at an airport because you're a Muslim. You're wearing a hijab. Maybe you might be dressed, you know, as a Muslim. You might have your beard and so on. And you're going and they stop you at the immigration and they interrogate you. As a result of that, you say, no, next time I go, I'm going to shave my beard. Next time I go, we'll take the hijab off and we'll actually just walk in our jeans and top so that no one asks a question. What? That was planned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to test your iman. What is the value of iman in your heart? What is its value? I don't mind being stopped for 10 hours, but I won't give up what I believe in because I don't believe it is bad at all. In fact, it is the best thing that I have. Subhanallah, I won't give it up. So what? They harass you. Be patient. Sit back, relax, smile. They will be amused by how you deal with this whole thing. Subhanallah. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum sacrificed their lives to protect the deen. We can't even sacrifice a little bit. We want to give it up. The hijab is gone. Why? Because you know what's going on in the world. They're looking at Muslims. They're harassing the women with hijab. Huh. Allahu Akbar. Take a look at Sumayya radiallahu anha in Makkatul Mukarrama. What were they doing to her? She didn't give up. Bilal ibn Rabah radiallahu anhu. What did they do to him? He kept on saying, Ahadun Ahad, Ahadun Ahad. You know that. What about us? Subhanallah, this is nothing. It is small. It's a challenge and a test that is actually out of the ignorance of those who look at us with the evil eye. It's our duty to ensure that we live the true Islam in a way that people see the beauty of it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us that way. So those were the companions. When we hear their names, we have to say, Radiyallahu anhu. 
no matter who it is. Radiallahu an. For you and I, it's radiallahu an. May Allah be pleased with them. Why? They gave up their lives. They tried. They worked hard. Allah chose them at the end of the day. You know, when I sit and I read the verses of the prohibition of alcohol and the prohibition of interest, and you say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about alcohol, فَهَلْ أَنْتُمْ مُنْتَهُونَ Will they not stop it? It was a prohibition. At a certain point, Allah instructed the believers to stop not only drinking alcohol, but serving it, dealing in it, dealing with it, dealing by it, carrying it, transporting it, etc., etc. Everything Allah says, stop. What happened? The Sahaba radiallahu anhum. Allah did not choose you and me to be Sahaba. Why? We might have said, hey, you know what? I've got five more containers of alcohol. I'll sell them. Then it's okay. That's what we might have said. They, as soon as one caller came calling to say, Ala inna al khamra qad hurrim. You know, he said, behold, alcohol is now haram. What was in their mouths, they spat it out. What was in their containers, they threw it. What was in the drums that they wanted to sell or buy or whatever else, they, they spilt it. Why? They had one quality in them that I want to rotate tonight's speech around. Follow the instruction of Allah immediately. That's what happened. When Allah said something straight away, it flicked, it clicked and they did it. They didn't waste time. Hey, hang on, wait. One guy is calling Khamr is haram. Wait, wait, let's sit back, relax. We'll find out tomorrow morning whether it's true or not. That's what we would do, I think. We might start messaging this one. That, Brother, the man was not, he's telling you, it's gone. It's over. Subhanallah, Rabbil Alameen. When something is prohibited, there is a reason why it is prohibited. If you perpetrate it, you will taste why it was prohibited through negativity. And if you abstain from it, you will taste why it was prohibited through positivity. You understand what I'm saying? May Allah grant us ease. When interest was made haram, immediately they stopped. Allah says, فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأْذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ If you're not going to stop this consumption of, of uh, usury and interest, then war be announced against you by Allah and His Messenger. I think if we were there at the time, from amongst us, there would be people who say, Allah is merciful. I'm sure for me, He'll understand why I'm doing it, you know? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. We are living in tough times. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us ease. But those were the Sahaba. They gave immediately into the instruction of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we say Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we acknowledge him. We acknowledge his companions. We acknowledge the message. We acknowledge that whatever he came with was revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We speak good about him, his family members, all of them. We don't just pick up two or three and we say the rest of them, they were not good. No, all of them were brilliant people. Believe that. You have to believe it. Allah chose them for a reason. May Allah make it easy for us. Like I said, they gave their lives. Hamza radiallahu an, he gave his life for you so that the deen came to you today. What are you doing as a result? Sitting and drinking. Astaghfirullah. You didn't appreciate what he did and what they did. Mus'ab ibn Umayr radiallahu an, what happened to him? Do you know? The battle of Uhud was fought. Why? For you, for me. So that the deen came to us. The battle of Badr took place for you, for me. So that the deen came to us. If it didn't take place, what would have happened? If the Sahaba radiallahu anhum refused, where would we have been? Subhanallah, appreciate it by learning, by being steadfast, by protecting yourself, by putting into practice what you've learned, and by teaching it in a beautiful way to others. And Allah will open your doors. Let's get to the second pillar of Islam. Salah. In the hadith of Jibreel alayhi salam, the Prophet sallallahu says, 
shahadati an la ilaha illa Allah wa anni rasulullah wa iqami salati wa ita'i zakati wa sawmi ramadhan wa hajj al-bayt man istata'a ilayhi sabila the first one is the shahada and i just said the other four what about salah i want to start off with the first point that i said earlier you know a lot of the times we make dua what is dua supplication okay we call out to allah for our needs and we think that allah is not answering us Allah is not answering us. So we make a dua. We say, Oh Allah, help me. Oh Allah, my health. Oh Allah, my wealth. Oh Allah, my children. Oh Allah, my this, my business. Oh Allah, whatever else you are saying. Do you know what's the problem? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us through the blessed lips of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in a hadith Qudsi. Man atani yamshi ataytuhu harwala. It's, it's a long hadith, but part of it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, whoever comes to me walking, I come to him rushing. It starts off by saying a little bit more detail than that. It says, whoever comes a handspan, I'll come afoot. Whoever's walking towards me, I'll come rushing to him. What does this mean? Have you ever thought of it? Imagine if the Mu'addin says, Hayya ala salah. As soon as you hear that, you drop everything and you're up and you're walking towards Allah. What happened? When the salah time began, you rushed to answer the call of Allah. When the salah time began, you rushed to answer the call of Allah. I promise you when you raise your hands, Allah will rush to answer what you want. He says that. The problem with us, Adhan goes on, we're still carrying on. Jumu'ah. The adhan went on, we are far away. The second adhan starts, we're sitting at the back lounging around. What's that? Astaghfirullah. That's a fitna, man. May Allah forgive us. Jumu'ah, we have no need to come in the front. We don't feel the need. Why? We're weak. That's why we have a reminder today to say, my brothers, let's make a promise to Allah. Jumu'ah, at least we must be there before the adhan starts. Before the adhan starts. I met a brother who you wouldn't believe, he doesn't miss a salah. I met a few of them actually. I met one man in Nigeria, subhanallah. Adhan went, he walked out. Wealthy man. He walked out. And I am still busy talking to you. Anyway, someone told me, no, we have to go for salah, we'll go, we come. I thought still he might not be well because he's a little bit old and so on. Do you know what he says? When we came back and I said, mashallah, that was good motivation. He says, my brother, if Allah is calling me, why should I keep on talking to you? Who are you? Subhanallah. The adhan went on. I said, but you know, at least if you said something, he says, but did you hear the adhan? You're a Muslim, right? You know what it's all about. Why should I tell you what it's all about? That muaddin said, come to success, which means there's no success in talking to you. Success is somewhere else. And wallahi success, real success. I'm talking of mega wealthy people. I've met these people in Africa, subhanallah, subhanallah. And we think we are awliyaullah, just because we read one khatam every month. Allahu Akbar. We think we are very pious, just because we have a miswak in our pockets. <laughs> miswak is very important. To do your khatam is very important. But no matter how much you do, a true mu'min should feel that I have not done enough. That's a true mu'min. Because wallahi, I've seen once we went to one of the countries, Malawi, many years back. And I recall seeing at the time of Asr Salah, people who were fulfilling Salatul Asr. And you know what? No one was watching them. It was in the, in the bush somewhere far away. And suddenly you see people, Sami Allahu liman hamid, they're reading their Salah. And nobody is telling them anything. You know, you would think that you're not going to find people so regular with their salah, that salatul asr, they're making it in jama'ah with a nice group of people. Come to Fajr in our masajid, no matter where they are. Perhaps maybe even here. The number of people can be better. Do you agree? The number of people can be better. Wallahi, my brothers... Are you interested in making a promise to Allah that, Oh Allah, I'm going to try my best, get up early and come for Salatul Fajr? You're going to make a promise, inshallah? If that is the case, tonight we've achieved. Everything is successful. Because even if you have moved one inch tonight, trust me, you have achieved a lot. May Allah make me regular with my own duties unto Him and then everyone else. Amen.
So remember this. Salah is so important that your dua and your closeness to Allah and Allah's closeness to you is connected to how you respond to the issue of Salah. I tell you there are a few factors. Number one, you never allowed to miss your Salah. There is no scope for a Muslim to miss his Salah. No scope. Unless you have overslept by mistake. Not like you put your clock for seven o'clock you, and then you oversleep and you say, no, I heard the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari. It says, Man nama an salatin aw nasiyaha, fal yusalliha idha dhakaraha. That whoever slept over a salah or forgot about it, true forgetfulness, they must read it as soon as they remember. So I, for, I, I slept. No, you set your clock for seven. That's the problem. Set it for five o'clock, the right time. And when you set it, don't turn it off. Get up first. Wash your face, then turn it off. Subhanallah. You might say, no, I'll disturb my wife. Get her up as well for the salah. <laughs> disturb my children, get them up for salah. So what? The house must be filled with noor at that time of the morning. Wallahi. Wallahi. So you get up, then you turn off the alarm. With us, we just put our hands while we lie down, find the phone in the dark, press the button, do something, it's gone, it's off. And next thing we're snoring again, before you know it, the rooster starts crowing. But subhanallah, even the rooster gets up very early. Do you know that? The crack of dawn, already you hear the rooster. But we are sleeping. Then when we make dua, we want Allah to reply immediately. Respond now. You know, subhanallah. But you didn't reply. So you're, number one, you're not allowed to miss your salah. Number two, don't delay your salah. Did you hear what we said? Don't delay it. Our problem, Wallahi, is okay, it's time for Asr. What time is Maghrib? So they'll tell you Maghrib is at 6.12. So you say, okay, I'll read Asr at 6.05. How can you do that? That is a makru time. That is something unacceptable. How can you decide, I'm going to delay my salah? Allah called you, you desperately need Him. Allah called you, you desperately need Him, but you're saying, hang on, last minute I'll come. Why do that? When you have a flight to go to another town, to another city, or to another island, you go how many hours before? One and a half, two, three hours before to the airport. Why? Because you know, I have to check my bags, I have to go. And finally, before the flight, you are sitting waiting near the gate, and there's still 20 minutes remaining. Am I right? What about your flight to the Akhirah? Your flight into Jannah? You can't come five minutes early? For your salah, your salah will take you to Jannah, isn't it? Salah to miftah babil Jannah. Salah is the key to the door of Jannah. So for the flight to go to Grenada or to go across here or there or to fly wherever, you're ready to go very early. You get up early, you make sure everything is a plan made. But for Salatul Fajr, no ways, I'm sleeping. Which is more important? You can miss your flight to wherever you're going, no problem. But you cannot miss Jannatul Firdaus. Remember this. You cannot miss Jannatul Firdaus. Remember this. So don't delay your salah and don't be a last minute dot com person. When you know in the masjid, Zuhur salah is 1.15 and you come at exactly 1.15, 1.16, first rakah. You know when you see the people who are late, they're always the, the same people. Subhanallah. I think I said that here the last time I came. Please, after salam, don't look back. Leave it. Make sure you are early. Make sure you are early for salah. We, are, we should be ashamed of ourselves that if we had a haram date, we would go early for that. But when we have the most important meeting ever in existence and we are running late for it every day, perfect it. Come on, do it right. Do it straight. You know, we are living in countries, I come from a country quite similar to this one as well, where to get to the masjid is a few minutes. There are people who drive 20 kilometers to get to a masjid and they are still early. We have to drive two kilometers. We have to walk for five minutes only. It's around the corner and we are still late. Come early for salah. Pick up some of the mushafs that are on the side and read the Quran for a short period of time. Make the dhikr of Allah. Call out to Allah. Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar. These words will get you to Jannah. You become a friend of Allah. And trust me, if nobody is your friend besides Allah, you have succeeded. And if everyone is your friend besides Allah, 
you have failed. Subhanallah. Amazing. So salah is a pillar of Islam. Man aqamaha faqad aqama deen. Whoever has uplifted it has uplifted the rest of the deen. And whoever dropped it, everything has dropped. The first thing you're going to be asked about, salah. Salah. Salah will actually come in the form of a person to protect you as you're being dropped into your grave. As you're being lowered into your grave. Subhanallah, that's your deeds, that's your sadaqah, that's your salah, etc. It's in the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa So my brothers and sisters, we can do better. When the time of salah sets in, stop what you're doing and fulfill the salah. Are we ready to do that inshallah? MashaAllah, I, I really believe that we, sh we were genuine in that inshallah. You know, sometimes when you tell someone uh, something and they say inshallah, that means no. <laughs> But today what I heard was real, insha'Allah. That means yes, we will. So I hope we will, insha by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's not going to benefit me. My deed will benefit me, but your deed will benefit you by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the second thing I was saying, don't delay your salah. The third thing, I've already mentioned it. I just want to repeat it because I wanted to say all three. One was don't miss your salah. Two was don't delay your salah. And three is the kamal. Before your salah and after your salah fulfill whatever sunnah or nafil is supposed to be fulfilled. Don't just come for salah, read the farah, the next thing you're shooting off as though you have an upset belly. No, people operate like that. Immediately after salah, they are running. Like there's a fire in the masjid or something. May Allah forgive us. Take your time before your salah, come in, come right into the front. The front section of the masjid and what you do for the ladies who may be reading at home subhanallah still the time of salah comes sit on your musalla a little while wash properly make your wudu nicely take your time making your wudu the hadith says the prophet sallallahu he says i will recognize you on the day of qiyamah by the shining of the places you used to wash while making wudu wash it properly so amazingly you will notice when you come early, your concentration is a bit better. Remember Allah, forget about the dunya. And you read salah as though it's your final opportunity to read salah. Last chance. And after the salah, don't rush. Sit and read some adhkar. You're 33 times, subhanallah, 33 times. Take your time to do that. See what happens. Take your time to read the adhkar. Get up and read your sunnah, read your nafil. And take a little bit of time. Yes, if you're on a journey, if you're a musafir, or if you're sick, or you have an excuse, no harm. You may go. One day you might be urgent and rushing. No problem. You might want to disappear after the farad because there was an emergency or there was some need. But that cannot be the case every single day. It cannot be the case every day. Fulfill this sunnah. Inshallah. Are we ready to fulfill the nafil and sunnah? Inshallah. Inshallah. You will be asked about that, inshallah. Remember that, you know? You will be asked by Allah that you said, inshallah, what happened then? May Allah make it easy for us to fulfill. So we will enjoy the prayer. Then we get close to Allah. So close that we become mustajabu da'wah. You know what's the meaning of mustajabu da'wah? You make dua to Allah, Allah listens to you. Why? Because when Allah calls you, you listen to Him. Subhanallah. And then you have yaqeen and conviction in your heart that if Allah did not respond to my dua the way I wanted it, I'm convinced that what he has in store is better than what I asked for. A few days ago, I spoke in Guyana and I spoke about the dua of Ayyub alayhi salam. And I'm so intrigued by this dua. Ayyub alayhi salam, when he made the dua to Allah, he was suffering. He lost his family members and his health and wealth. And he lost it and he was literally what we would term below par. But when he raised his hands to Allah, he did not complain of anything. He did not say what was wrong. And he did not ask Allah what to do. Nothing. He just says, this is the verse that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of in Surah uh, Al-Anbiya. Allah says, that was his dua. 
Allah says, remember Ayyub alayhi salam, when he called out to us, what did he say? He said, oh Allah, harm has reached me and you are the most merciful. That was his dua. He didn't say, do this for me, grant me cure because he knows, oh Allah, you are merciful. You know what to do. That's it. You know what has happened to me. You know better than me what happened to me. And you know better than me what needs to happen to me now. Subhanallah. Take a look at this dua that we are taught to read of Yunus alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that Yunus alayhi salam, when he went away and he was now in the belly of the whale, did he say, Oh Allah, I'm in the belly of the whale, take me out of here? No. He just said, La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kuntu min al-zalimeen. There is none worthy of worship besides you, O Allah. And I declare that I am from amongst the wrongdoers. I did wrong. That was his dua. He didn't say, take me out. He knew that if Allah is happy with me, I'm going to come out of this place. That's what he knew. So he made istighfar. He's asking Allah's forgiveness to say, I did wrong. <laughs> I inni kuntu min al I am the one who was the wrongdoer. And you, there is none worthy of worship besides you. I have no Lord besides you who's going to answer me. You alone. So Allah says, we took him out of that gham and distress that he had. Ayyub alayhi salam, Allah says, فَاسْتَجَبْنَا We immediately responded to him. We replied, we responded. Subhanallah. My brothers and sisters, this goes to show us. When we get close to Allah, Allah will get close to us. تَعَرَّفْ إِلَى اللَّهِ فِي الرَّخَاءِ يَعْرِفْكَ فِي الشِّدَّةِ Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa teaches us. He says, get close to Allah during days of ease. And Allah will get close to you during your days of difficulty. He will make you happy and content. You will be content. Let's move on. Third pillar. Zakah. Zakah. When you, zakah is teaching us not to be selfish. Teaching us that whatever we have does not belong to us. Zakah is a charity but it is not exactly the translation of the English term charity because it has in it, the English word has in it an element of being voluntary. But in the Arabic language, zakah is not voluntary. It is compulsory. So it is a unique type of a charity that you have to give. Certain percentage. What is it? Two and a half percent in most cases. How many? Two and a half. From every hundred, you give two dollars fifty. That's it. But still we are lazy to calculate zakah. Brothers and sisters, when we are lazy to calculate zakah, may Allah not do it to us. He can, in, he can afflict us with sickness, with disease, with hardship, with loss, with loss of wealth, with loss of health, with so many other things. Why? Because you did not calculate your zakah and you were lazy to give it out on the right time or in the right time frame. So give your zakah. Give more than the zakah. Point number one, don't ever cheat by not giving zakah because you cannot cheat Allah. Number two, don't delay in giving your zakah and don't work it out in the weakest possible way. People say, okay, I'm giving zakat. Okay, let me look at my business. You see, this stock here is dead stock. Let me give the dead stock out. I'll calculate its price and I'll give it out in zakah. Why give dead stock out? Subhanallah. Why give dead stock? Give something that people will take, they will like. Or give the wealth of it. Give the equivalent in value, but give it. When you give your zakat, your health will improve. Do you know that? Your family relations will improve. When you eat halal, the disputes in your family become resolved. They are resolved. Why? Because you're eating halal and you're giving others. You're reaching out to others. The hadith says Allah continues to help a slave for as long as the slave is helping others. So help others, reach out to them, give them more than the zakah. You know, zakah is actually change. Look, if you were to walk into a store and you bought something worth $97.50 and and you gave the lady $100 at the till. She has to give you back $2.50. Who does it belong to? You. Why? You gave her the 100 in the first place and now you want back 250. It's mine. 
You only were supposed to take 9750 of that. Give me back my 250. If she doesn't, she's a thief. Do you agree? Every 100 that Allah gives you, that change of 250, if you don't give it, you're a thief. Because only 9750 was yours. The other 250, Allah says, I gave you the 100, I want back my 250. And I will tell you who to give it to. That's how zakat works. So when you've given the change, you've, you've been honest. So you will be rewarded for your honesty and for having given that change correctly. But if you want a bigger reward, you need to give more than that. To say, oh Allah, okay, that was yours, but now I want to give from me. <laughs> from me, I'm going to give another $10. Yeah, take it. That is called sadaqat, something voluntary. We call it lillah, give it for the sake of Allah. That is what makes you a better person. The zakah is there. But what really draws you closer to Allah is actually that which is beyond the zakah. Now you're giving it from you. Because you know when you're calculating something that you have to give, you're giving it. You gave it back. Okay, my zakat. It's not easy to give lillah for the sake of Allah from your pocket. Oh Allah, I thank you so much. You gave me a million, five hundred thousand. I'm just going to give it. I don't even want people to know what I've done. Then you're talking. Then you're talking. But with us, even the zakat we got to give, we have to go to the maulana, the sheikh, and we got to ask him, hey, just make sure I'm not giving any extras here or there. Astaghfirullah. I know in Barbados that doesn't happen. But in some places it does. They'll come to you and tell you, look, I've got this much of gold. Are you sure I need to give zakat on this gold? And you look at them and say, but what are you talking about? So the sister will say, no, you know, my husband's supposed to pay. My sister, is it his gold or your gold? It's yours. You give the zakat. No, but you see, it's in one piece. Break the piece. So what? Sell it. Do something else. No, I can't sell it. My mother gave me. Okay, explain that to Malakul Maut when he comes. <laughs> explain that to the angels in the grave or in the hereafter. Say, you know, I had a bangle. Too late. Too late. You break it for the sake of Allah. Allah will protect you. He'll grant you goodness. He'll give you more, 10 more than that. You broke it. If you were not liquid, even the men do it. No, I owe zakat. My zakat is 200,000. But you know, I got three, four buildings. I don't have that liquid. No problem, sell one of the buildings. How can I sell a building? Sell it. When you go down in the grave, your children will be killing each other for the same building. Rather sell it now. No fitna. Your children will love each other later on. Wallahi. But we don't realize. We do things to set our kids. Not realizing that when we die, the more you've left behind to set them in a better way, they actually start fighting for that. I've seen it with these eyes. And I'm sure you have. Because that's what Allah wants to show you. That look, that's not what you were supposed to do. Let me teach you one thing about money. Money that you've not spent, your name is not written next to it. The time your name is written next to the money is when you spent it. Then your name is written. If you have not spent it, it's only in a holding pen. Minute you close your eyes, the name, somebody else's name is written next to the money you sweated to earn. Why? They inherited it. Subhanallah. So money is yours when you have spent it. Then your name is written. So spend your money. I was talking the other day about, you know, when people pass away, we start asking what to do for this person. What should I do for this person? So some people say do this. Some people say do that. And all sorts of people come up with all sorts of things. Do this for them. Do that for them. Give that for them. Do this for them. I want to tell you, yes. By all means, Muhammad sallallahu has taught us certain things to do. Correct. But what have you done in your life? You know, when the hadith speaks of sadaqatun jariya, it is speaking about you in your life having given a sadaqa jariya. That's a guarantee. Because in my life, I drilled boreholes for myself. I built a masjid, my name. When I say my name, I don't mean I showed off my name, but I mean I did it for the sake of Allah. I did it. I drilled boreholes, I did it. That will definitely benefit you when you die. That is the true sadaqa jariya. That is what it is. I hope you understand what I'm saying. Because go back to the hadith. The Prophet ﷺ says, إِذَا مَاتَ بْنُ آدَمْ إِنْ قَطَعَ عَنْهُ عَمَلُهُ إِلَّا مِنْ ثَلَاثٍ when, when a human being passes away, the deeds are cut except from three things. And a few things are mentioned. From among them, ilmun yuntafa'u bih. Knowledge which he or she taught and left behind so that people will continue benefiting. That is a sadaqa jariya for the one who passed away. Are you getting what I'm saying? 
another one is the term sadaqatun jariyah is also used in the same hadith any charity that the benefit of it is extended you continue getting a reward for it as long as the benefit is extended people are benefiting from it you're getting a reward subhanallah oh the hadith says or oh, a child that you've left behind you invested in the good upbringing of the child such that the child makes dua for you when you've passed away you benefit from that if someone does something on your behalf yes it can be done within certain limits but there is no guarantee that that reward is going to reach you, such as a hajj. Say for example, you know we do hajj badal, and hajj badal is definitely there, it's permissible, it is something that the sharia has made permissible. But if I had the money, and I didn't do the hajj, and I don't have an excuse, and I did not write in my wasiya that the hajj should be done for me, then when someone else does it, it's only up to Allah whether he wants to take it or not. Ask your ulama, they will confirm what I've just said. Hajj was farad on you. You didn't do it. You didn't write about it. You didn't have an excuse. You didn't say, please do the hajj. In a wasiyah, in a, in a bequest, you didn't bequeath it. You didn't say something about it. If that's the case, your children might do it for you. Your relatives might do it for you. Whether it's accepted or not is totally up to Allah. But when you did it yourself or you wrote that I couldn't do it, we didn't get a visa or I was not healthy, etc. And you've written, then inshallah it will be accepted on your behalf because it will come out from that wealth of yours as well. And even if it didn't come out of that wealth, someone volunteered to do it with their wealth. The fact that you've written about it by the will of Allah, it will come to you. There's a small technicality here for those of you who might have a slightly deeper understanding of this. You may have picked it up. The point I'm raising is zakat. Give while you're alive. Sadaqat, give while you're alive. And even give, subhanallah, charities that will benefit you beyond your death. Trees, boreholes, whatever else it is, knowledge that is given, etc. Let's move on to the next pillar. Fasting in the month of Ramadan. Now we're talking of the fourth pillar, right? Fasting in the month of Ramadan. We all know that in Ramadan, fasting is compulsory. I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I want to say two things. Number one, ask yourself, am I a totally different Muslim in Ramadan? If the answer is yes, then something is wrong outside Ramadan. Someone who drinks Someone who does wrong, someone who commits adultery. The first day of Ramadan, they tell the man at the pub, hang on, I'll be here after 30 days. What was the point? You have a girlfriend, you quit first of Ramadan, you say, don't worry, eat day, we'll meet. How? What was the point of the fast? You haven't understood why fasting is a pillar of Islam. To teach you restraint and self-control. That's what it is. That's one of the benefits. So halal food, nothing wrong with it. I can stay away from it morning to evening. Then definitely I can stay away from haram during other days. And I'll appreciate halal. My own spouse, I have to stay away from her during daylight hours of Ramadan. Then surely I will be able to stay away from that which is totally haram outside Ramadan. It's made easy. It's like when we say salah. In salah, you're looking down at the place of your sujood as you're standing. And no matter what's happening, you're still looking there. So outside Salah, you are being obviously given a free gift to be able to control your gaze. I'm looking at everything else, mashallah. Look at the buildings, look at the ocean, look at the fish, and look at everything else. But you lower your gaze when there is something haram. It becomes easy for you when you, when you look in Salah down. You know, when I, one day, when I was studying in Medina Munawwara, there was a man reading Salah. And he was looking like this, moving his head. I don't know if it happens, you know, some people are, they don't have concentration. So he's moving his head and looking this way, that way. And we were two guys, you know. So I'm nudging my friend. I said, look at this guy. 
So I, he, he said, what's he doing? I said, look at him, he's reading salah and he's looking this way, that way. So when he looked at us, I put my hand. He actually did this salah and put his hand. Then he realized he's reading salah. I say, that type of concentration, my brothers and sisters, be warned, be careful. Be careful. We need to look down. You look down and you make sure that you're looking down. So that at least outside of that salah, you can control your gaze by the will of Allah. Going back to the fasting. So fasting is such that if you are to do it correctly, it, you will achieve taqwa. Taqwa meaning consciousness of Allah throughout your life. You can't just say Ramadan. Even the non-Muslims know that Ramadan is a month where Muslims become real Muslims. Subhanallah. They say that. Oh, Ramadan. So now we're not going to see you here anymore. Where? Casino. Astaghfirullah. It's happening. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us. So that was the question I wanted to ask for myself to answer and for yourselves to say, are you the same Muslim in Ramadan and out of Ramadan? If the answer is yes, good news to you. And if the answer is no, something wrong outside Ramadan, you better start doing things. Fast extra days, Mondays and Thursdays, Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, very healthy for you and very rewarding spiritually, very elevating as well. And then you can fast the three days of the month as per the sunnah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You see, if you notice all these acts of worship that are pillars of Islam, there is an element that is farad, there is an element that is sunnah, and there is an element that is nafil. In all of them, whether it is zakah, whether it is salah, whether it is saum, and even the last one, and I'm getting to it now, the fifth pillar of Islam is, the last pillar of Islam is hajj, mashallah. May Allah take us there. When Hajj is compulsory upon you, go. Don't say, hey, I'm young, man. You know, I'm young. What does that mean? Do you still plan to sin a little bit before you go? Is that what it is? You haven't committed enough sins? People have died. Younger than you. Younger than me. They've gone. What happened? I hope they didn't say, hey, I'm still young. May Allah forgive us. Allah decides when you will go for Hajj by giving you the means. That's what we believe. I don't decide when I'm going to go for Hajj. Primarily, Allah makes it farad on me. The minute I have the means, I have to make the effort to go. I had one man, extremely wealthy man. He came to me and asked me, is it possible for me to send someone else to do my Hajj? And I said, but why? He says, because you know, it's very dirty when you go there. A lot of disease, there's meningitis, there's people dying, there's stampedes. I said, no. You cannot, you're a human being. On the day of judgment, when you are resurrected with everyone, you're not going to be able to say, hey, this guy was the guy who died with meningitis, and that guy died with yellow fever. No. You cannot do that. You have to go. It's you, it's your obligation unto Allah. Like the masjid, you can be the wealthiest. You can't say, I can't stand next to this guy, because you know what, he was in the hospital last week. No. You have to stand there for the sake of Allah. You can't say, he's poor, he's rich, he's black, he's white. No. This is the beauty of Islam. You stand in the same saf. You have to stand in the same saf, shoulder to shoulder. You must stand that way. We are brothers and sisters in faith. Subhanallah. So you have to go for Hajj, you go. And guess what? Even in Hajj, there is a minor pilgrimage known as Umrah. Umrah. And I will end on this point, inshallah. Umrah is a minor pilgrimage. It's not farad. But I want to suggest to everyone who has the means that when you are considering going on an international holiday, Try to change your intention sometimes by taking your children to a spiritual place with the intention of Umrah. Because it will awaken them at that age. You know that children below the age of 15, it's not easy to get a visa for them to go for Hajj. But for Umrah, they will go. So sometimes when you are considering going here and there, spending a few thousand dollars, perhaps you might want to consider the trip of Umrah. I tell you why. A lot of us now, we have this idea of spoiling our families and going here and there. Yeah, it may be a good thing. If you're doing it within the limits, it's a good thing. But when we go, we sometimes don't have a place to read salah. We sometimes miss the salah. We sometimes don't have a proper place for eating. We sometimes don't have proper facilities. And our children, we are just, you know, at leisure. It's okay within limits. But surely it would be spiritually far more beneficial if you were to go back to the holiest lands 
on earth. Take your children there. Go around the Kaaba, make tawaf with them, be in the mataf, sit and read the Quran, meet the other Muslimin, see people from across the globe, show them how Islam is so international. There are people from China, from Africa, from Europe, from South America, from North America, from Australia, from Korea, from Russia, from wherever you mention it, they are there. Subhanallah, that's Islam. It is so beneficial for your children, yourself, your families. When you make a trip for Umrah, may Allah make it easy for us to go there again and again. Say Ameen. Amen. So my brothers and sisters, I've spoken for exactly an hour. And I've spoken about the five pillars of Islam. And I've mentioned a few very important points regarding these five pillars. I told you I will keep the talk very basic. It was about five pillars of Islam. And I mentioned the importance of knowledge at the beginning. And I spoke to you about how if you want Allah to get close to you, you have to make an effort to get close to Allah. Definitely it will happen. I hope I will benefit from what I've said inshallah and yourselves as well. It has been an absolute honor to be standing here in front of you for the sake of Allah to say a good word to bring us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, closer to one another, to let us love one another for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For indeed my goal, your goal, all our goals is to enter Jannatul Firdaus. That is the entire idea. If we have been granted Jannah, we are successful. And if Jannah is not something we are granted, we would have failed no matter what we had in the dunya. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us all. Aqulu qawli hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.